Hello, this is our review of chapter 8, and in chapter 8, we are going to be looking for cases where duplications signal some type of anomaly. So, here we go. We have three main tests here. We have same, 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 which is a straight duplicate. We have same, same, different, which is a near duplicate. And then we have the subset number duplication, which is a formula. I talk about uh, running the tests in Excel or Access. And we have uh, two interesting fraud cases that uh, are included in the chapter. Now, this is our first one. I call it same, same, same. It really doesn't matter how many sames you use. We're looking for flat out duplicates. And what I talk about here is during the planning phase, some creativity is needed. The reason for this is if we simply just look for all types of duplicates that could exist, we are going to get a huge number of false positives. And if you want to do a little reading on what false positives are, they are things that will take up a lot of your time uh, for no good payback. So for the District of Columbia purchasing car data, I'm looking for same amount, same date, same agency, and the same merchant. You would think that this is unlikely to occur except by a rare coincidence. And here we go. Uh, each of the results is on one line because it's a duplicate. I can simply tell you what the count is. And right at the top here, we have the date, Department of Transportation, McDonald's for exactly $990. And this occurred 14 times. The Disney Resort, 11 times this amount on this date for Parks and Recreation. Probably not the sitcom, probably the real Parks and Recreation. Here we go. Marriott, well, this is a more reasonable number than that. So, we go all the way down and right at the bottom, we have uh, twos over here, which means that this, is, uh, this was duplicated. And we see all sorts of odd things here. July 2012, the tree expert, two purchases using the purchase cards of this amount. So we have a large number of hits here. Um, I go up here, I see this McDonald's for 990 again. Um, and so we'll, see, we'll get back to McDonald's at the end of the chapter. Lots of duplication. And uh, we need to know, we need to uh, dive into this data to find out why this might be occurring. Duplicate assisted frauds. In short, what somebody in the accounting department does, maybe the controller, maybe the CFO, uh, or maybe simply a, a payments person with some authority, what they do is they make an intentional second payment of say $1,805. They then go and ask the vendor for a refund of the overpayment, which was supposedly an error. And then they divert that refund for their own use. Um, this one is quite easy to carry out. Uh, I'm always smile because students enjoy this case. The reason they enjoy this case is because it tells you quite clearly, step by step, how to do it. If you ever wanted to pull this fraud off and trusted employee he opened a personal checking account in the name of something that was very close to the company's name he communicated with uh, there were five vendors involved here and uh, what he did was he intentionally overpaid them and he asked two of the vendors to send him a check uh, back but you know getting a check in the mail you have to sort of get your hands on that check and that might be a problem so it looks like for two of the vendors, he asked them to wire transfer the overpayment back, but back to his personal checking account. This was the date where everything unraveled. This was uh, his last day at work, and this was a duplicate payment of 189,000 that he diverted for his own use. And as you can see, we, in the previous chapter, we talked about relative size factor, this is way out of line with anything else that happened up here. Um, I, it's strange that he went so big. It, 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 there might must be more to the story. 
What we see over here, and these are some of the internal court documents, it says that his fraud was discovered as a part of an account reconciliation. And if we actually go out of here and we go back to have a look at the 2020 ACFE's report to the nations, you can see that uh, account reconciliation only accounts for about 4% of the detection of fraud. So 1 in 25 frauds is detected through account reconciliation. It works. If it's done properly, we get it. And uh, as before in the previous surveys, TIP, amazingly, is always at the top of the list. You know, with TIP right at the top of the list, this should tell us that using uh, forensic analytics to actually go and proactively look for frauds uh, should be very beneficial because that's not how we're discovering things. We are discovering it more through luck. Anyway, account reconciliation um, was the way that this was discovered. And I just include the bottom of, of this here. He was in prison for 12 months plus one day. That's because uh, the sentence for a felony must be longer than a year. So this is one year and one day. And I think if I remember correctly, we're talking about over a million dollars in this fraud. Over a million dollars, 12 months. That's not very high. The second test is same, same, different. And here we are looking for near duplicates. We are looking for a number of sames followed by a different. And let's have a look here. In this case, we have the same amount, the same date, the same merchant, but two different agencies made a purchase on that date for that amount with that merchant. So it's a near duplicate. Those are the same and those are different. Over here again, same amount, same date, same merchant, but two different vendors purchased for exactly this. And these are high numbers for purchasing cards. And so uh, this has given a good payback. Oops, didn't mean to do that. This has given good results in case in accounts payable audits. And uh, what we've looked for here is if we looked for cases where the wrong vendor was paid first and then the correct vendor was paid, presumably after calling for their money. So we pay the wrong vendor, then we pay the correct vendor, which means we are going to have same amount, same invoice number, same date, same everything except different vendors. And uh, this picks this type of error up and it is a really nice payback when we find these types of errors. This is Susan's case. And uh, Susan also had what we would call near duplicates amongst the, the, the type of things she would do. She would claim for mileage for a personal car and claim for airfare or um, some other mode of transport. So it is close to a duplicate. And this is Susan's case, and I usually use Susan's case at the end uh, when I give a one-day workshop or a two-day workshop. Susan is my closing case. So, Susan was under an internal investigation for reconciliation delinquencies. She failed to do the required reconciliations, um, and she was tardy with that. I'm not sure why somebody that was using the card for a, a fraud would be tardy and, and draw attention to it. Officer Williams came in March of 2010. Officer Williams got a binder. Officer Williams got an explanation. They talked about Susan claiming fraudulent reimbursements, forging her supervisor's signature. And so he got a complete binder, everything there. It was March of 2010. It took until the end of 2010 for anything to even happen. In 2011, we have first appearance, and at the first appearance, uh, the uh, defendant is usually asked guilty or not guilty. The correct answer to that question always is not guilty. You can always change your mind. 
uh, it's hard to go from guilty to I'm changing my mind and now I'm not guilty. Well, you can see numerous fail to appear, fail to appear, fail to appear. And this carried on almost throughout all of 2011, just not going. We're nearer to 2012 now and things are starting to happen. This is pre-trial and fail to appear again. This is the end of 2012. And just remember, Officer Williams was called in March of 2010. Pre-trial again. So um, it's not quite three years, but it's a long delay. Susan then agreed to plead guilty. And I include the transcript of this because it is interesting to see that under our legal system, they make every effort to make sure that the defendant knows what it is they're doing when they enter a guilty plea. Um, lots of safeguards, lots of questioning, and uh, this process can take three hours, uh, no problem, with, with every question asked with sincerity and, and, and uh, a serious answer being required. Has anybody forced you? No. Decision is yours? Yes. Freely and voluntary? Yes. Because you are in fact guilty? Yes. I once was in traffic court and I heard a lady who was asked, are you, because you are, in, are you pleading guilty because you are in fact guilty? And she said, well, not really. Um, and the judge sent her back to the prosecutor and said, the, the two of you sort this out, come back to me when you're going to answer yes to this question. This is Susan's plea agreement, and Susan got the best deal that you could possibly get. Plead guilty to, no, to, to, to the charge, no executed jail time. Restitution is stipulated at 150000 um, The amount in question, I think, was uh, closer to 220000 and um, what Susan's attorney uh, um, argued was that according to the statute of limitations, the first 70,000 happened more than six years ago. And so um, he didn't want to uh, repay that. He was only going to do the amount within the statute of limitations, which was the previous six years. So pay back about two thirds of what you took. No executed jail time. Um, no shoplifter would get such a good deal. You really simply can't just give the shirt back and um, everything is. You can, can't just give back two-thirds of the shirt and expect to come out okay. This is my PowerPoint slides that I use when I um, do the Susan Thompson case. And over here, what I like to point out is it could be that that, that embezzlement cases are given, uh, just t they take so long to happen because the police are actually busy. This is Duluth, around 80,000 residents, if I remember correctly. This is the year 2010. Remember, March of 2010 was Officer Williams. They have 10,000 things to deal with. 10,000. Strike Quite amazingly, embezzlement won. They actually summarized in their report what this embezzlement case was all about, and it wasn't Susan. So, in fact, Susan even disappeared off of this report. Um, well, Susan had a sentencing date. The senten sentencing date was Valentine's Day in 2013. There I was. I was flying in. I'd followed the case for three years. I wanted to see what was going to happen. So I flew in. It was freezing cold. This is me outside of the county courthouse. Um, this is about 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm early. That's a very thick jacket. It's, uh, it's, it's, due, it's February of, um, in Duluth, Minnesota. It's cold. So everybody was there. It's 1.30. Um, the prosecutor was there. The uh, victim company was there. The, um, her defense attorney was there. The uh, press was there. Internal audit of the victim company was there. 
everybody was there except Susan. So, this is absolutely amazing. She was scheduled to be sentenced at 1.30. The judge waited until 1.55. It is absolutely unheard of for a judge to wait for a defendant on sentencing day. So this case has a lot of um, a lot of strange things happening in it, but uh, Susan was uh, eventually apprehended and about a month later was sentenced. Uh, very tearful out at the sentencing hearing. Uh, deeply apologetic. Apologized to family. Apologized to the court. This is the um, prosecutor for dragging this all out, for not being respective. Everybody regrets their actions um, on this day. And, and I've been in federal court when somebody's been sentenced. And it is tears and, and lots of regrets. Um, but, it's, but it's usually only on that day. Well, you don't have to read the whole thing. It says... Convicted to 21 months, the court will stay the execution of the sentence, which is basically just go on probation for six years. Also, we'll stay here for the felony crime of failure to appear for a sentencing hearing. Stay that as well. So, um, when I conclude, when I actually give the lecture about Susan and I conclude... I conclude with a few powerful points. One of them being uh, insiders commit fraud, outsiders commit fraud. We'll see Charlene Corley uh, later on committed fraud against the Department of Defense. The legal system is overloaded. Companies should therefore not rely on the legal system to be all that much of a deterrent. Companies themselves need strong internal controls and Proactive fraud detection measures. Proactive fraud detection measures exactly, which is the uh, which is what the topics uh, in the book are all about. Now, this is right at the end. I wanted to develop a formula where I can look at a subset and tell how much duplication is occurring in the subset. I wanted to quantify how much duplication there was. If there was no duplication, all numbers were different, I wanted to give it a score of zero. If all the numbers were the same, I wanted to give it a score of one. And so I just had to solve this little mathematical riddle. How can I go from everything different, a score of zero, everything the same, a score of one, how can I kind of put this into a formula? And it came up with this. The number frequency factor is here. What I do is I look at the numbers, the total number of numbers in the subset. So if there are nine numbers in the subset, nine squared is 81. And then for each of the numbers that occurs, I count how many times it occurs. And if it occurs more than once, I square that number and I add up all those squared numbers. So here's an example. I have nine numbers over there. This number occurred five times. So it's 5 squared. This number occurred twice. So that is 2 squared. These occurred once each. So I'm not squaring anything. 5 squared plus 2 squared. And there are 9 numbers. So I'm dividing it by 9 squared. And so I will get a result over here. Which says the level of duplication is sort of reasonably high. And what I can do here is I, I can compare subsets. You are you have more duplication than the other ones, and I can simply focus on those with high levels of duplication. This is what we got from the uh, purchasing car data. This McDonald's had a score of one, and the only way you get a score of one is if all the numbers are the same. And so I give the minimum amount 990, the maximum amount 990. All the numbers are the same, so. These two should be equal. There were 40 numbers. So there were 4,990s for a total of 39,600. And indeed, I would want to know why we are spending $990 at this McDonald's 40 times 
during the period of Z that we're looking at. All of these have number frequency factors of 1, which means that all the numbers, there's another McDonald's for 990, 14 times, all these numbers are the same. 2000, start to finish. 1595, start to finish. Many of them up here, so I would focus my, my um, attention up here, but maybe not so much with the um, Department of Transport registration. This looks like this might be the fee to register something. So with this vendor, we're paying this fee repeatedly. We're paying it 14 times. That might seem reasonable. But here again, we go Subway. That's an awfully long sandwich. 175 bucks, $5 foot long. To me, that sounds like a um, $35, 35 foot sandwich. So, the motivation here is excessive duplications. And just remember, we, we're homing in. We're homing in on little groups of odd transactions now. And uh, we're calling these transactions odd because of duplication. We need to be planned. The tests need to be planned because we don't want that many false positive. We look at exact duplicates, near duplicates, and in this case, a formula that quantifies the level of duplication. I enjoyed writing this chapter, I enjoyed updating it, and I hope, uh, I hope you get some, some good results when you run your tests. And so, from me to you, it's bye-bye. Uh,